Can you hear me, everyone? I'm, I'm going to look into the chat function to see if anyone's having any audio issues. We'll get started in about two or three minutes. All right, good afternoon, all of our non-public test coordinators. Um, I'm gonna get started now. Um, I know we're, we're expecting a few other people, but I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So um, let me introduce myself. My name is Shannon Bell. I am assessment specialist here at Aussie. Um, my role during test security, during the test administration season is to oversee all things test security. Um, we will likely be interacting with each other um, over the next couple of months, so um, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions as we go through the training. Um, before I start the presentation, I want to um, point you to a few things on your um, webinar dashboards that will be useful to you. Um, there's a section in your dashboard that there's a questions text box. Um, please, as we're going through the training. If you have any questions, type it in the questions box. I have my colleague Cassie Linet here who will be answering questions as I go through um, this presentation. Additionally, there are two handouts that are in the handout section of this webinar. The first one is a copy of a PDF copy of this presentation. Um, please go through that as I'm speaking. There are links um, that I mentioned throughout the training that you could access via that document. Uh, the second attachment there, there is a non-public test security training packet. So there are a few documents that um, I will talk about in the middle of the training. Um, all of those documents will be in that attached packet. Um, so please let me know in the questions box if you are having any difficulties accessing either of those documents. All right. So getting started, um, we want to go over the agenda today. So this training is um, a first part of two possible trainings that you'll be attending today. Um, in this training, I'll just be talking about test security here in the district um, and what that means for all of the non-public schools um, where students we have placed in those locations. Um, I'll briefly talk about access and our alternate assessment MSAA, um, giving you the contact information for that individual who will be overseeing those assessments. Um, and then lastly, there is a Park DC Science 
webinar that will follow directly after this one um, that will be held um, by Ms. Cassie Linet. She will put the link in the question box if you would like to attend that training. Um, it is today from 3.30 to 5 p.m. All right, so let's get started with test security. In this training, we have um, a number of things that we'll go over. Uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll start by talking about an overview of test security and integrity here in DC. We will also talk about the roles and responsibilities for all individuals that are involved with testing on all of our levels, the state, LEA, and school level. We'll go over some requirements and steps that need to be taken before testing. So during your planning stages, um, getting ready for test administration, um, we will go into our school test security plan platform. So that's one of the major requirements that happens before um, testing can begin is that all non-public schools have to submit a school test security plan to OSSI. So we'll go through the system that you um, would need to use to fill that out. Then we'll move on to talk about things that need to happen during testing. So during administration time, there are a number of test security tasks that need to happen. Um, we'll go through each of those different requirements. And then we will end our time together by talking about um, a few requirements that have to happen once testing is finished at your non-public. Um, so we have a couple of object, uh, objectives for the end of this training. So we hope that by the end of this training, um, you as non-public coordinators will be able to identify and differentiate all of the roles and requirements that are set by law here in DC by the state, the LEA and the non-public school level. Um, we hope that you'll be able to know all of the required actions and steps that need to be taken before, during and after testing. Um, as I said, we'll go over the school test security plan and um, you'll be able to know how to both fill out strong answers in the plan and also how to submit that document to us. Um, and then we'll also talk about things that happen during administration, um, things around the secure testing environment and what constitutes prohibitive actions during testing. Um, you'll see these two links a lot um, as I go through this training. Um, all of our documents for test security are all housed in one location. Um, everything will be You'll be able to find everything in our um, test security and incident forms webpage on our Aussie website. You'll be able to, as we um, get more information, we link new documents there. Um, in addition to all of our test security documents, there's also um, materials having to do with uh, the test administration manuals for PARC, DC Science, MSAA, DLM, and Access. All of those. Um, Manuals can be found at the second website here. <clears throat> um, for all of those who are unable to access the handouts, I will be sending these out. Um, so anyone who is registered ahead of time um, will receive these attachments as well. All right, so let's start by doing an overview of test security here in the district. At the beginning of our trainings, I always like to read our vision as an assessment program here at OSSI. So OSSI's goal is for schools and local education agencies to deliver a un uniform and equitable state assessment program for assessments to yield fair and accurate results. The assessments must be administered in consistent and standardized conditions. The best way to ensure that occurs is to ensure educators understand and recognize acceptable and unacceptable assessment practices. Um, so what that really means is we know that um, our students in our non-public locations and all over the district, the educators are working hard to make sure that students are ready to take these assessments. We know that it takes a lot of time out of your schedules and we want to make sure that any results that we have, we can use them across the district. Um, so we want to make sure that when we're thinking about test security, it's not just about rules, but it's also about making sure that our testing environments are as uniform and equitable as possible. So I just want to do an overview of all of these statewide assessments um, here in 2019 at OSSI. So our first assessment is the Access for L's 2.0, 
assessment. This is our English language proficiency assessment. Um, it tests from grades K through 12. Um, our alternate assessment is the multi-state alternate assessment. We usually call it MSAA. Um, the subjects there are English language arts um, and mathematics, and it's tested yearly in grades three through eight um, and once in grade 11. Um, our park assessment is an English language arts and mathematics assessment um, yearly in grades three through eight and one assessment in each of those subject matters in high school. Um, this year we've added back DC Science and DC Science Alt called the DLM. Um, it is our science assessments and they are tested in grades five, eight, and biology. Um, I wanted to point out a couple of important dates around test security this year. So our required non-public test security training is happening right now. Um, thank you all for attending. It is a required uh, training. We will have a recording of this training um, both on our website and also in the school test security plan application. I will um, show you where that will be when we get to that point in the training. Uh, the other major task that happens before testing is uh, school test security plans are due. Um, these plans have to be approved by OSSI before you may start testing at your non-public school. Um, and in order to make sure that we have the time to do that, test plans are due 15 business days before the first day you plan to test at your school. Um, our statewide testing windows access is our first statewide assessment. It starts next month, February 25th, and ends on April 5th. Our MSAA and our alternate science assessment goes from March 18th to May 3rd. Our park assessment starts on April 1st and ends May 24th. And DC Science starts one week after on April 8th and ends one week after on May 31st. Um, other major tasks that happen during um, testing would be monitoring. So we at OSSI and the LEA, and in your case, the non-public schools are responsible for monitoring during the assessment window. That would happen the entire time um, intermittently during the assessment window. Um, and then the last major task um, are test security affidavits. Those are to be submitted to us within 15 days, but you'll be submitting them to your LEA coordinators 10 days after the end of the last test at your non-public school. All right, so let's have a brief conversation about um, policy here as um, in DC, DC is unique in that um, all of our rules and regulations around test security are all based in law. DC is one of the few states in the country um, that have laws specifically around test security and integrity. And so all of the requirements are based on these laws and regulations. Um, I'll talk about the Test Integrity Act of 2013 and the two amendments in 2015. Um, every year we release test security guidelines, which are supplements to our law. And then also we have test coordinator and administration manuals that also form some parts of this training. So our first document um, that is really the basis of all things that we um, when we think about test security and integrity in the district is the Testing Integrity Act of 2013. Um, in that act, there it defines all of our key terms and roles. It also um, determines who all the individuals are, who are authorized personnel at the LEA and the school level. Um, it also talks about all of the requirements that we at Aussie have to adhere to, as well as um, you at the non-publics and your LEAs. Um, it also list out all of the prohibitive actions, um, the things that are not allowed to happen during testing. It talks about sanctions that can result from any investigations that would happen at the end of the test administration season. And it also goes through the appeals process if there are findings at the end of an uh, investigation. So in 2015, there were two additional amendments to um, go along with the Test and Integrity Act. Um, in those amendments, there were a few things that they clarified. They changed some um, dates, due dates and requirements. One of the main ones I always like to call out 
is that test plans are due 15 days before um, the first day of a testing window in a school. Originally in 2013, it was 90 days before. There were also, also some requirements, uh, additional requirements that those amendments made for OSSI. So we are required to provide um, all of our guidance within 45 days prior to testing. Um, and then there are also some other um, requirements as you can see here on the slide. So our guidelines, um, our guidelines are a longer document um, that we at Aussie produce yearly. Uh, the purpose of those guidelines are to provide more context um, and usability around um, all of the laws that are established in the Test Integrity Act and the amendments. Um, we go into more detail on each of the requirements. We also provide um, additional guidance and tips um, that we believe will be helpful and useful for LEAs and school coordinators. Um, this document is housed in the same place that all of our other test security um, documents are placed. So if you have time, you want to go through our guidelines, it is available to you there. Uh, lastly, the last bit of documentation that we use as a basis of our test security here are our test coordinator and administration manuals. Um, these manuals are not created by Aussie. They are created by the vendors for each of our assessments. Um, they are available online on the link listed here. Um, in those manuals, there are instructions for test coordinators, technology coordinators, test administrators. It goes through the procedures and the protocols and all the required actions that need to happen for the specific assessments before, during, and after administration. <coughs> All right, so now that we have our basis in policy, I want to move on to talk about the roles and responsibilities for all individuals um, for testing. So as I said before, in the Testing Integrity Act, um, there are very detailed roles and responsibilities for each level of individuals um, for Aussie LEAs and schools. Everyone has unique roles. Sometimes these roles um, will overlap, overlap um, in the instances for non-publics given the time, space, um, challenges that we have. Um, so you'll see throughout this presentation, there will be um, clearly defined roles for Aussie, um, defined roles for the LEA and defined roles for non-public. Um, just a high level, at, on the OSSI level, we are responsible for establishing policy regulations and guidelines. Um, we provide the initial training for LEA coordinators um, and also for non-public coordinators. Um, we review and approve all school test plans for all schools, including non-publics, um, before the start of testing. Uh, we also monitor during <clears throat> um, test administration time, and if need be, we conduct test integrity um, investigations and review after um, testing has been completed. Um, on the LEA side, there are responsibilities that the LEA would normally have, but in the it's for um, non-publics, there are things that will overlap. So the first thing would be um, normally LEAs would be the person to would be the individuals to file school test plans um, because not public because of the distance constraints. Non publics will be submitting their own test plans directly to Aussie. Um, at your non public schools, you would be identifying any additional authorized personnel. Meaning um, we'll go over what that means um, here in a second. Um, at the non at the non public coordinator, you're responsible for training those individuals. Um, there's a integrity notification statement that I'll talk about. If there's any monitoring that would happen at your non public school, um, as the coordinator, you would be responsible for uh, coordinating that, um, re reporting any breaches of security um, or integrity, and then collecting your own affidavits and then submitting them to your LEA. Responsibilities that are specifically for the school level would be to create the school test security plans. Um, you would be responsible, of course, for receiving and maintaining the materials at your school, making sure that they're secure. Uh, at the non-public level, 
Um, you all would be administering the assessments, keeping the test security file, ensuring that the testing environments are secure, reporting any breaches that happen during testing, and then of course submitting your affidavits to the LEA who would then submit them to us. All right, so there are a number of individuals at the LEA and school level. Um, they all have um, specific tasks that need to happen and jobs that they do during testing. All of those individuals are considered authorized personnel. Um, authorized personnel will be any individual um, who has access to the statewide assessment or will be directly involved in the administration of the assessment. So there are a few things that the, all of those individuals are required um, to do. The first would be to complete a test integrity training developed by OSSI. As I said before, we at OSSI, we train the LEA coordinators and also the non-public school coordinators, uh, but we also follow a train the trainer model. So at the non-public, if there are additional individuals who will be interacting with your uh, secure materials or the test, those individuals would need to be trained by you. Uh, we will provide you, of course, with um, this deck and the materials that I use during the training. If you want to use, excuse me, if you want to use um, these materials, you can, um, but you will be responsible for training those individuals. Um, there's a notification, a security notification statement that you receive that I'll talk about here in a second. As I said before, any breaches of security, all authorized personnel are required to report those to the non-public and then also to OSSI. If there were investigations that would arise at the end of a testing season, all individuals would need to cooperate with uh, that investigation. All authorized personnel must refrain from prohibitive activities and prohibitive actions and um, authorized personnel are responsible for knowing all of our directives and our guidance. So the first role within the authorized personnel is the test integrity coordinator. Um, this person is an LEA level role. Um, they are responsible for ensuring the testing integrity and security for the LEA and all of the schools or campuses in their preview and their purview. Um, the LEA may have up to three individuals who are responsible for those roles. And starting last year, we were able to have a park coordinator, an MSAA coordinator, and an access coordinator. Uh, there are a few specific requirements for the LEA coordinator, um, which would be to designate support and train your school monitors. In this case, because non publics are um, not a part of the LEA, the LEA as the non-public coordinator, you would be um, receiving training directly from OSSI. Um, same way the LEA coordinator would typically be the one to um, come do test security training, but we have a training just for non-public coordinators. Um, submitting the school test plan would typically be an LEA's responsibility, but for non-publics, non-publics will be um, submitting their test plans directly to us here in OSSI. Any monitoring that would happen um, during the school season, during test administration, um, LEAs can come to your schools to monitor, but in those instances where you are out of state and it's not feasible for an LEA to monitor, the non-public should be monitoring the test administration at that school. As I said before, everyone's responsible for reporting breaches in security or any deviations to the test plan. Um, investigating during testing. So this is not the same as the investigation that OSSI may conduct at the end, but during test administration, if there are uh, things that the non-public feels need to be investigated or more information needs to be gathered, the non-public will be responsible for doing that. Excuse me. And then lastly, um, as a non-public coordinator, you would be signing a test security integrity affidavit and submitting that um, to the LEA. The LEA would then take all of those and submit them to us at the end of the testing season. So all of you on the call are most likely um, school test coordinators is the legal role. Um, we also call these people test coordinators. So I may say 
not a public test coordinator, not a public school coordinator. That is the same as the school test monitor. Um, this individual is responsible for um, testing integrity and security at the school campus level. So um, all of you will be responsible for making sure that everything is secure at your specific non-public location. Um, the same way that the LEA can designate up to three individuals to play these roles at your non-public schools, you can have three non-public coordinators. You can have one for PARC, DC Science. You can also have a separate person for MSAA and a separate person for access. That's not a requirement. You can be the person for all assessments. Um, if your school is only have taking one or two of the three assessments, of course, you do not need to have an individual designated for an assessment that your school is not participating in. <coughs> um, at the school level, um, as a non-public coordinator, you would be responsible for training all additional authorized personnel at your school. So any additional test administrators or proctors, those people would need to be trained by you. Um, you would attend the training that we're currently working through right now. So thank you for your compliance. Um, You'll also be creating and submitting the school test plans, um, conducting additional trainings, as I said, for all of your school set staff, um, pre, uh, disseminating the school stand, uh, the school test plan to any additional staff that will be participating. Um, you would be overseeing all secure materials at your school, supporting any additional um, personnel who are administering, you would be responsible for, um, you would be that first line of defense and assistance there at your not public school, and you would submit the affidavits, as I said, to the LEA. Another person at your um, school could be the test administrator. So this person is identified by you at your school. They're responsible for administering the assessments to students. Um, in addition to all the other things that all authorized personnel are required to do, the test administrator is responsible for uh, conducting sessions as outlined in the test administration manuals, establishing a secure climate in their classrooms or wherever um, they would be administering the tests to students. They would be responsible for coordinating the distribution and return of those secure materials to and from students ensuring that any students who require accommodations receive those appropriate accommodations in their group. Um, and they would be ultimately responsible for accounting for and maintaining security of all test uh, materials while they are in their custody. Some additional people, an additional individual that may be at your non-public school is a test proctor. Um, so this person would be there to assist test administrators with the administration and classroom management in their classroom. Um, they do not have to be employed at your non-public. They could be a volunteer or a parent. Um, just keep in mind that if a parent is going to proctor, they may not proctor their own students. Um, that individual may also administer accommodations if that is something that the test administrator would like the proctor to do. <clears throat> and there are a few instances where proctors are required um, by law and a few instances where they're not. So a test administrator, a proctor is required when a test administrator is administering the students for their subject for that test. So let me explain that. If I am the math teacher and I am giving the, my students the math assessment, I would need a proctor there to assist. If I'm the math teacher at my non-public and I'm giving the English assessment, I would not need a proctor because I am not that teacher of record for that subject. So in those instances, a proctor would be required. Um, the, another way that a proctor would not be required, so if I am the English teacher and I'm administering the English language arts assessment to a student who has a familiar adult accommodation, a proctor would not be required. Um, for those schools who are assessing, excuse me, um, 
MSAA or access, proctors are not required in those instances at the non public. Um, additional individuals um, that would be unauthorized personnel at your non public school would be a special populations coordinator. So this person um, could would be there to assist you as a non public coordinator in identifying and documenting all testing accommodations for students. Um, they could be the individual who would also train test administrators on how to administer accommodations for students. Um, they would be monitoring during testing to make sure that students have the correct accommodations um, and also to ensure that students who don't have accommodations are not receiving accommodations. Um, if your school is taking the alternate, any either of the alternate assessments, that individual could be the person to coordinate as well. Your school does not have to have a separate individual to play the role of special populations coordinator. So if you're in a small um, non-public and you are the non-public coordinator, you may also play the role of the special populations coordinator. The last individual is the technology coordinator. Um, so this person is there to assist the test, the test monitor, which will be you, um, in preparing all of the technology and devices. Um, during testing, they would also be there to troubleshoot any technological issues that may arise during testing, um, and they, of course, would be responsible um, to come to training and do all the things that all other authorized personnel are required to do. All right, so let's talk about the planning season um, and the things that are required to happen. Okay, so there are a few tasks that we at OSI are required, and then there are two columns, as you can see, of things that the non-public will be required to do. Um, we issue the standards at OSI, we train, we also issue the test and integrity notification statement, we review and approve all plans, and we establish standards for testing and monitoring. In the non-public school, you would identify and train all of your authorized personnel, if you are training additional people at your school, you would also give them the testing and security and integrity notification statement that I'll show you in a second. Um, you'll receive, you'll receive um, inventory, distribute, keep secure all the testing materials that you'll receive from the vendors. Um, you're responsible for reviewing all of the test man uh, manuals um, and administration guides. You would be responsible for developing and maintaining the test security files, preparing the technology, and notifying students and parents that they will be testing before testing will begin. Um, so the first major step is the test security and integrity notification statement. For those who have, who are able to access the attachments, um, the first document that you'll see is the test security and notification statement. Um, as I said before, if you are not able to access the handouts, um, I will be sending those back out at the end of this year. So the test security um, and uh, notification statement lists out all of the prohibitive actions as listed in the Test and Integrity Act. Um, it is something that is required. Everyone who receives any type of training regarding test security is required to receive this document. Um, it is listed in the same location it's posted in the same location as all of our other test security documents. Um, so if you ever need to access this document, you can always go to this site and it will be clearly labeled as a test integrity and test security notification statement. Um, as I said, it has to be handed out to all individuals during your school training. So any additional people that you're training, we do not require that signatures, um, anyone signs these documents. We just want to make sure that everyone receives it. Also at that training, in, additional, in addition to the test integrity and notification statement, uh, non-public coordinators are responsible for training any additional staff. Um, we don't specify what that training needs to look like or what form it needs to take. Um, we also don't specify what the presentation needs to look like. As I said before, we will provide this training deck 
to you in, um, in PowerPoint format if you would like to use this to train your additional staff. Um, but you can also make it look however you need it to look. We just have a few requirements that have to be covered during that training. The first is, um, of course, distributing the notification statement, reviewing the school test plan that you submit to us, uh, a review of our test security guidelines, which can be found in the same place that all of our documents are housed, a review of all of the test administration procedures um, that can be found in the vendor supply testing manuals. Who uh, requires training? So as I said, all authorized personnel at your school um, are required to receive training by you. Um, we ask that it is documented by being placed in your test security file that we'll talk about. Um, and in there, we need training materials. So whatever format your training looks like, if it's a PowerPoint, if it's a handout, whatever that is, whatever those materials are, we ask that you put that in the test security file, um, that you have a sign-in sheet for all of those who attend the training. Um, you also put a copy of the notification statement there. Um, and the distribution roster is just a list of all the individuals who received the notification statement. But as I said, um, they're not required to sign. Um, on this page, we just wanted to provide a link of all of the individual test coordinator and administration manuals. Um, so since you have to go over these things during your non-public school trainings, we wanted to have a place in the PowerPoint that just links to those documents. All right, so now we'll talk about the school test, um, school test security plan. This is a, a document that all schools have to submit to OSSI. Um, in that plan, it goes through a number of requirements. Um, it asks questions about what your school's plan is to ensure that materials are secure. It asks about all the authorized personnel at your school and how those individuals could potentially report irregularities that may come up during administration. We ask um, about your school's plan for um, investigating during testing, if you need to get additional information, how you would fact find. We ask you a series of questions about your school's plan for handling logistical and communication issues. Um, we ask for a detailed testing schedule, um, and there are a number of um, tasks that have to happen specifically for PARC and DC Science. We ask for um, an affirmation of those things as well. We'll go into the system here in a second, but I wanted to provide an exhaustive list of the major categories in the test security plan. <coughs> So the school test plan serves as an uh, official communication for OSSI. Um, not only is it a requirement um, for schools, we also want to make sure that the document is useful. We hope that the test plans, um, that you will follow them because we closely review them to make sure that they are um, in a shape that is helpful for schools and students. Um, as I said before, school plans must be submitted to us 15 business days before the first day of testing. Um, we review all test plans, and if there are changes that need to be made, um, they will be bounced back. Please make sure that you make this deadline, um, because if your test plan is not approved before the first day of your intended start date, you may have to push back your start date. All right. All right, so there are a few characteristics um, that make a strong test security plan plans that um, will not have to go back for additional review. Um, this is based on the reviews of previous years, and we wanted to point those out. So strong test plans are ones that are succinct and clear, are well organized, are thoughtful, and thorough. Um, the, as we'll see in a second, the types of questions that we ask are a series of uh, multiple choice, 
short answer. There are a few longer answer responses. Um, we wanted to make sure that the questions were extremely clear so that um, when you, as you're working through your plan, you'll be able to um, understand what we're asking for. Um, we do review every plan very closely. Um, so we wanna make sure that you have the tools that you need in order to hopefully get them approved the first time around. So characteristics of weak plan, we've seen plans that are very difficult to follow, um, have incomplete sentences or incomplete words sometimes, uh, are not thoughtfully prepared, and are generic. All right, so now we're going to um, walk through the system. For those who already have access, uh, maybe you were a test coordinator, a non-public coordinator last year. Um, if you have access, you can go into the system by following this link. Um, if you don't have access, don't worry about it. You can send me an email at the end of the training and I'll be able to grant you access. Um, for those who don't have access, if you have your packet, um, we've moved on to document number three, which is the test security uh, plan exemplar. And feel free to look through that as well. One second, and I will move on into this. Okay. Okay. So now we are in um, the system. This is what you will see when you log in. As I said before, if you don't have access, please send me an email and I will um, grant you access immediately after this training. So here is your homepage. Um, if there are any additional or new notes or announcements that we need to make during um, testing or as we prepare for testing. They'll be listed here. They'll most likely be in red. Um, this, all of this text here are just instructions on how you can um, access your test plans. Um, there are also a number of helpful links here. So the first link here, at the end of this training, we, we are recording. The webinar will be listed here. You can click on this link, it'll open up the recording. The test security plan instructions, which are in the packet that I've attached, um, are listed here. The exemplar, which is document number three, is linked here. Um, our test security and incidents page, so this is where all of our test security documents and training uh, materials are. You can find it by clicking on the link. The test coordinators page. So this is where all of the test administration manuals are listed. You can click on this link to access that page. And then the last link here is if you want to start a new test plan. But before we do that, I want to go through the rest of this page. So this report here um, will list out all of your, um, any of the school test plans that you maybe have started. Um, as you see, I have a few here because I have granted myself access to this particular school. Um, you will only see your schools. Most of you should see no um, records here because you haven't started any test plans for this year. Um, if you do see any test plans and you have not started one, please let me know um, so that I can remove it. Uh, the next part of your homepage, which is probably the most important part of this page, is your schools without reports. So these reports um, are, will show any schools that we think deserve a school or need a test security plan that have not been started or submitted. Um, 
what I've done is gone through our system and looked for any non-public schools that I believe um, need an MSAA and or PARC assessment, or in some cases, an access assessment. Please go through this list, each of these reports, and make sure that you see the proper schools, your um, proper schools here. If you see schools that sh will not need a test plan, so if you Maybe last year your school had an MSAA plan, but this year you don't have any students taking MSAA and you see a school here, please send me an email so that I can remove that school from our list. Um, on the inverse, if you don't see a school that you should see here, please also send me an email so that I can either add that school to the list or give you access to that school because it can be either of those issues. This is another way that you can um, start a test plan as well. But before we do that, I just want to show you the last um, report here. So here at the bottom, for those of you who were non-public coordinators last year and you submitted plans to us, you should see your reports from last year below. Um, if you click on the reports that you have, you can see the types of answers that you put in. If those still work this year and that's your school's plan, you feel free to use that information again because all of the plans listed here are the ones that are approved. So you'll be able to see the final steps of whatever um, version you started with. <coughs> so since there is about three ways that you can start a plan, I'm gonna go down to our schools without lists. Um, as you see here, there I have associated myself with Newport News School. Um, you'll see that it's the schools without. So if you want to start a plan for that, you can go to add a new test plan here and it'll open up a new test plan for you. Um, for those who were coordinators last year, it's mostly the same, but for any of their new individuals, the first thing that you'll do is select who you are. Um, all of you are not public coordinators, so please make sure that you select the correct um, individual. The next step would be to tell us what assessments you're filling your plan out for. Um, you may fill out one test plan for multiple assessments. Um, just as you check or uncheck, uh, the form will require additional information. So in this case, we'll make it a combo test plan of PARC and MSAA. Um, what you would do is you would select your start date. I'm just going to select any date here, but make sure that you put in the correct information. And what you'll notice is once you put in your start dates, the application will calculate when that test plan is due for you. Um, even if you're not ready to fill out all of your plan, I ask that you go in and start a plan for each of the assessments that you will be filling out a test plan for and enter in the start dates as soon as you have them. Um, this is really important because once you uh, put this information in and save the plan, the system will automatically remind you as you approach your deadline. You can also put in the end date and whatever other information you have. Um, the next section um, asks about general information. Um, you would put in your information here. Um, if you are going to be the um, coordinator for all of the assessments, feel free to put in your name every time. Um, that's fine. And your phone number. Uh, this section here is really important. Um, for those who were non-public coordinators last year, um, the number one reason that test plans were sent back was because this little table was not filled out correctly. Um, this is a place that you would list all of the LEAs that are associated with your school. So, if you are an LEA, I mean, if you're a non-public and you have multiple LEAs here at DC that you have students listed in, you don't have to enter in a test plan for each individual LEA. You just need to list out every LEA that you have students listed. So how you do that is you go to the re related LEA box here, you would double click. This is a drop down of all of our LEAs here at DC. And you would select whatever school or whatever LEA there. Once you do that, um, the LEA name will pop up. Don't worry about any of these other sections. They will populate after um, the test plan has been saved and it doesn't really pertain to anything that you need to do. If you wanna select another um, LEA, you would just go in and you can, in theory, you can do that as many times as you need. If you have 20 LEAs that you have, you can just keep selecting and the box, uh, the table will just automatically add 
um, additional fields, as you can see. So make sure that you um, list out all of your LEAs. Um, it's really important because even though LEAs are not approving the plans and we at Aussie are approving the plans, once the plan has been approved, the LEA will be able to access this plan. And so we want to make sure that all the LEAs who need access will have the access. Um, similar to the boxes here at the top, you would enter in who's the special population coordinator and the technology coordinator. Again, if you're that individual, um, that's fine. Uh, uh, one little note here, there are these little icons that you may see throughout the forum. These are just um, helpful hints and tips. As you toggle over them, they might have a note for you there. And in your exemplar, um, document number three of the test security packet, um, each of the questions have been answered in a way that um, we believe are a strong, robust plan. Um, you'll see that there are also some tips and reminders throughout the exemplar. So um, as you're filling out your non-public school test plan, I think it's really important for you to look through our exemplar because it's extremely detailed. So I won't go through each of the questions here. So as I said, you can um, review what types of information we're looking uh, we're looking for in the exemplar. But I want to point out different types of fields that you may see um, throughout the form. So these shorter lines are um, short text uh, short text boxes. So these typically when you see these, we're not looking for a long answer. You just want to make sure that it is um, <coughs> answered fully. For our longer boxes, um, we don't require that you fill out the entire box, but we do think that um, the answer may require more than um, a shorter answer. You may also see a few fields um, like this that are multiple choice and conditional. So um, in this case, if you select yes, that you will be destroying, locally destroying, it'll ask you additional questions there. And if you select no, those things will not show up. Uh, another type of field that you'll see here in the application are multiple select boxes. So um, there may be instances where multiple choices are um, applicable. So um, if you see that, you can go in and check as many that apply. Uh, this, this field is also that way. Um, and as I said, the longer boxes indicate that most likely the answer should be a little longer. In this section, there's another conditional and there are hints throughout the exemplar that um, get, get at what we're looking for here. <coughs> um, section seven is very similar to section six. It's just asking about um, your internal investigation uh, process at your school. Section eight is just asking, it lists out all of the prohibitive actions that are listed in the test integrity and security notification statement. And it asks if your non-public has any additional uh, prohibitive actions. You don't have to have any additional ones, but if you do, we wanted to make space for you to put those additional actions there. Um, I wanted to call out specifically section number nine. Um, based on last year, this is the other section that um, got plans sent back most often. Um, so as you're reading through these questions, please make sure that you answer them Clearly, if you go through our exemplar, um, especially for these last three questions, um, I went into extreme detail on the types of information that we're looking for and also tips and reminders on uh, things that potentially got uh, sent back last year. Our goal is to make sure that um, test plans that are sent to us are hopefully approved on the first go round. So please make sure that as you're answering these questions, they are thorough and clear. Uh, section 10 of the plan are just assurances. So a lot of these assurances have to do with the requirements that I have stated um, throughout the um, training. It just asks that you certify those here. Um, because I selected that this plan is for a park, um, there are two additional um, requirements that things that have to happen in Pearson Access Next. Um, this was the third way that non-public plans got sent back a lot because um, these two requirements here have to be completed before we can approve the plan. Um, here at Aussie, we, as I said, we review every plan extremely 
thoroughly and we do go into Pearson Access next to make sure that all of this information is entered correctly. Um, to get more information on how to do this correctly, um, please stay for the Park and DC Science training that will happen immediately following um, this one. Uh, Cassie has put a link in the chat function to that training and she'll go through in detail what happens in the PAN system because I know we had a lot of difficulties with entering information uh, last year in the system. So the last section before submitting will be uh, attaching the authorized personnel and school schedule of uh, the test schedule. So there are templates here. You don't have to follow our exact template if you have um, a schedule that works for your um, school. You can attach those, uh, those, both of those attachments below. We just ask that um, you make sure that these data points are in your um, whatever your document looks like. Um, we did send ten, uh, test plans back, uh, particularly test schedules back, because it didn't have all of this information listed. Uh, particularly the location. A lot of times we saw test schedules would have all of the individuals, the dates, the subjects, um, but there was no classroom or um, PAN sessions listed. And we do ask that that information is there. Um, if you want to use our templates, please make sure that you do that. The reason why you see multiple attachments here is that um, if during test administration, um, the schedule may change or the who the authorized personnel are may change. Either you need to add an additional person who's been trained or you need to remove a person. We ask that you update that um, in somewhat real time and attach those in the attachments here. So the last step after you have filled out all of this information is to um, submit your plan. So this, all this information here is it's showing you how to um, submit a plan. But what you do is you click down on the status and you would select submitted. And you'll see a note here um, and you'll also receive an email once you save and close the record. What I'm going to do is try to save it and I'm going to get an error message. Um, that is there because um, if you try to submit a plan without filling out all of the blanks, you will get an error message. So if you want to start a plan but you're not ready to submit it yet, just keep it in draft status um, and you'll be able to save it and close it. So I'm going to do that so you can see what happens. So as you see, um, the new plan that I just started is now in my school plans here. It's still in draft status. You can see your school. You can see uh, what you selected and who the owner is. And if you scroll down here, uh, before both of those plans were in the schools without list, but because I've started a plan for the um, location, those schools are no longer listed. So that's a good way to check to make sure that your plan has been saved. I'm gonna go back into the plan because I wanna show you um, one last thing. So if you ever wanna go back into your plan, you go to the school plans table and you can either view it if you just wanna look at the information, but because I wanna edit, you always click on the pencil. So now that you're back in the plan, um, what I'm gonna do is show you what it looks like if um, any revisions are required because that is a little different from last year. So at OSI, we would select needs revisions and um, I would put in, um, we would put in information. I'll just show you what it looks like. So last year, there was just a box that just had um, like a text. Uh, we would type out all the things that needed to change. This year, we've changed it around. So um, we've included the section name, the, the section number, so you'll know where to look. Um, we'll select the source. It'll always be Aussie in your case because LEAs are not reviewing your plans before um, they come due. And then I'll write in whatever it is. Um, whatever the note is um, will be there and you'll see that there. Um, when you log back in, this box will be visible if we say that there are revisions um, that you need to complete. Um, in this case, what you would do is you would come back down to this section, review whatever those notes are, um, go back to whatever section we said. So I said section four, come back up to floor and enter in whatever, whatever the change is, you would make the change 
and then you would go back down to this box and make sure that you check revisions completed. When you select that box and then change the status to revision submitted um, and save and close, um, we will get an email back. Whoever's reviewing your plan will get an email letting um, them know that you made those changes so they can go back in the system um, and approve the plan or provide additional revisions if required. Um, this last box here um, is for you at the non-public. If you have any questions or you need clarification on whatever the revision notice that you receive from Aussie, you can put that information in so the person who's reviewing your plan can go back and read anything that um, you may have wanted to say. And then, as always, you can always save it and close it. And you'll see, you'll be able to track the status of each of your um, plans as you go. The last thing that I'll show um, is if once a plan is approved, if, if we've gone through, looked at everything, decided that it's ready to be approved, at Aussie, we will change the status to approved. You'll see an approval statement that comes here and then a note about a section 13. So if during testing um, you have any minor deviations to your test plan, meaning something in any of these answers above have changed, you can always go back and put those deviations here in the deviations box. This box was here last year, it's just in a different location. Uh, the last two things that you'll see on your plan are plan to improve documents and a fact-finding inquiry document. Um, we'll talk about it when we talk about incident reports, but there are instances where we may require an additional document from your non-public school. Um, we will communicate that with you if it ever comes to that, but you can always find those templates here. You would download them, fill them out, and attach them here in your plan and save and close. So that is the platform that we use to submit plans. If you have any questions, um, you need any help submitting your plan, or you have questions about the types of answers that you want to um, put in your plan, you can always um, contact me and I'll be happy to help you. All right. So getting back into the last thing that needs to happen before <coughs> testing begins is at the non-public, you're responsible for notifying students and families that they'll be testing this year. Um, we have a template of what that parent letter could look like. We don't require um, that you use our template at all, but if you want to use it, you are more than welcome to. It is translated in multiple languages and you can access it here. If you are going to create your own document, um, we just ask that um, you have all of these requirements here, um, letting people know that what the purpose is and the dates of testing, encouraging positive attitudes about testing, um, talking a bit about accommodations, making sure that people know that for students who have accommodations, they will receive them, et cetera. And you can always reference our document um, for more information. <coughs> All right, so let's talk about what happens during testing during the administration season. So there are key tasks. Um, there are a few tasks that the LEA and the public share, um, but at Aussie, we are responsible for supporting you as a test monitor and also the LEA coordinators um, during testing season. We also monitor um, on site throughout the entire administration season. At the LEA, they are responsible for also supporting you. So if you need any need information, they can be there to support. They also monitor um, all of their school sites. Um, at the non-public, you will be responsible for maintaining a test security file that I'll talk about in a second, following all the information that you submitted to us and was approved in your test plan. Of course, administering the assessment, um, making sure that the materials are secure, following the chain of custody, um, and following all directives. Um, at, also, a shared responsibility would be to actively monitor and manage the testing environment at your non-public, and then of course to report irregularities and incidents and breaches of security that may arise during test administration season. So as I said, the first step, um, the first 
major test security task that happens during test administration is monitoring. So OSI and coordinators and LEA coordinators as well are responsible for monitoring for security during administration. Um, here at OSI, we have a, a auditor checklist. Um, it is a list of guidance and guidelines that all of our OSI monitors follow um, as they are monitoring at schools. Um, it is when it is updated, we provide that um, checklist so that schools can have access to it and know what we're looking for when we're coming into their locations. It can be found at the same site that all of our test security documents are located. Um, at the school level, at the non-public, you're responsible for maintaining a hard copy test security file. Um, so this file can look like a number of things. Most people um, have some sort of a binder or file folder um, that houses all of the test security files for any given year. Um, so in that um, file, your, a copy of your school test plan should be there. Um, any deviations that may happen um, during test administration should be there. The, as I said before, the training attendance sheet, the training materials, should be there. Any incident reports that um, you receive from your school staff should be there. Um, chain of custody documentation as provided. Um, you can either use the vendors or your own. That should be in the file. Uh, any concerns or notes. The affidavits at the end of test, <coughs> test administration should also be there. And also whatever copy of um, a parent letter or accommodations letter um, that should also be in your file. Uh, there is a document that lists all of the things that should be in your file um, listed on our website where all of our other test security documents are housed. Um, it is a checklist. I would suggest that you go there, um, download it and fill it out, keep it in your file so that you know all the things that need to be there. Um, we do ask that this is a hard copy um, document uh, file and not uh, electronic because um, if an investigation would ever need to occur, um, what, whoever the investigators are have the right to um, request that up for up to four years. So it's important for you to keep that on file for four years in hard copy form. All right, so now we're gonna talk about um, the next uh, task that happens during administration around test security, and that's reporting incidents test administration concerns and minor deviations. So um, minor deviations are deviations that um, are different from whatever was in the approved test plan. So that could be a change in authorized personnel, um, timing changes, um, changes to information that you presented in your file, changes to your schedule, um, all of those things should be reported in the test security file because we, um, when we are going to monitor or when we are doing any possibly desktop monitoring, we always look for the test security file to be a live document. So uh, as you have made minor deviations, we ask that you put those in the test plan in the place that I showed you um, when we were going through the system. If you have a new schedule, um, we ask that you attach that to the attachment section in your test security file, but all the other things can be written out in the modern deviations um, box. <coughs> um, in your test security file, um, in addition to all the things that I listed before that should be there, um, any incident reports that both that um, you report to OSI or things that are not a breach in test security, but could be test administration concerns. Um, those should all be housed in your file. Um, any breaches of test security or integrity that happen during administration um, or accommodations, misadministrations should be reported to OSI via an incident report. Um, there are three ways that you can submit an incident report to us that we will talk about here in a second. Um, so we wanted to go through um, a list of when incident reports should be submitted to, to OSI. These are instances when they should be reported. So if a student becomes ill or injured and they cannot um, complete a testing session that they've started, you should um, document that and submit something to OSI so that we can talk about next steps. 
Um, if a student is in possession of a cell phone or uses that cell phone during testing, that should be reported to OSSI. Uh, if a student takes, if a student is cheating or if uh, a test administrator is uh, coaching a student or directing them or cheating in any way, that of course should be um, submitted to us. Um, if a student or an authorized personnel or an unauthorized personnel is in um, possession of materials when they're not supposed to be and it could constitute cheating, that is another instance where OSI should be contacted if you lose secure test materials. So secure test materials um, could look for electronic tests are testing tickets or scratch paper that's been used, um, any um, support materials that are provided by um, the vendor. Any, if any of those are lost or left unsupervised, meaning um, they were left in a room and the test administrator was not there or they were left alone with students, um, those are considered test integrity and um, security issues and those should be reported to OSI. Um, if a student does not receive an appropriate accommodation, um, that is extremely important and that should certainly be reported to OSI so that we can take make sure that students are able to take that correctly. Um, if there is a, an emergency at your school and students need to leave the environment, um, we should know that ahead of time. And if there are technical issues, um, like a network issue or an issue with the computer, um, and the student is not able to finish the test that day, um, but they've already started, that's another time that um, an incident report should be submitted to us. There are a few instances where something is happening at your school, but it doesn't need to be submitted to OSI. Um, and this is that list. So if there's a technical issue, like a network issue or, or something wrong with the computer, but the student is able to finish the test um, within a given day, that's something that you can put in your test security file, but it's not something that needs to be reported via an incident report. Um, if a student needs a different computer or tablet um, during testing, that's not Again, something that's not uh, need to be documented. It's a report, but it is something that you can include in your test security file. Um, if student behavior is happening, um, but it doesn't in interrupt the session or interfere with other students or their ability to complete the test. Again, this is an incident, but it's not something that needs to be reported via incident report. It's just something that you could put in your test security file. Um, if you need to change the test administrator, or the proctor, that is a minor deviation, so make sure that you put that in your test plan, but it doesn't need to be submitted via an incident report. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there are a few ways that um, incident reports can be submitted to OSI. Um, for those who have access to our OSI support tool application, um, it can be submitted there. That's mostly for LEA test coordinators. Um, so. That's not really anything to worry about. The other way to submit incident reports is by using our online incident reporting form. You can click on this link or go to the same place that all of our test security um, documents are housed and there's a link directly to our online incident reporting form. You can fill that out. It'll come to us via an email. Um, if you need us to reach back out to you, please make sure that you put your contact information um, in the form. It can be submitted anonymously, of course, but um, if you think that we need to reach back out, please put in your information so that we can um, get that, make the next steps as soon as possible. The other way that you can submit an incident is by calling our assessment hotline. Um, the number is here. It'll be on our website as well. Um, it's not a working it's only on when testing is beginning. So if you need to contact anyone about test security before testing starts, I ask that you um, go ahead and contact me directly. All right, um, so there are a few other times that you would maybe need to communicate with OSI other than an incident report during testing. The first we've already talked about, which is minor deviations that you can put in the school test plan. Um, if you followed along in the um, school test plan application part of this training. It is there and it will show you exactly where um, to put in that minor deviation section. 
Um, the last two are documents that I mentioned when we went through um, the application, but the first is the plan to improve test plan document. So this is a document that we may require you to fill out um, if you submit an incident report to us that um, is dealing with an egregious test security violation or if there are multiple um, minor test security incidents that the same types of incidents um, are being reported at a school, uh, we might ask you to complete this document. The document just goes through um, asking you what types of problems you're having at your school. And it also asks you to think about ways that you can um, fix this issue so that it's no longer um, an issue throughout for the remainder of test administration. The other document that we may ask for is a fact-finding inquiry document. So if you submit an incident to us or call in an incident to us and we feel like we need additional information um, in order to take the next steps, we may ask you to fill out an inquiry document. It takes you through um, the types of questions that you need to ask. It asks you who you talk to to get the additional information um, and then you submit that back to us. We can determine any additional next steps and we would communicate um, those with you as we get the information. For the both of the last two documents, um, when we ask you to complete them and re-upload them into your test security plan, they have to be um, completed within 24 hours. Um, I know that seems intense, but it's extremely important because we wanna make sure that if there are any additional steps that we need to take as a result of either of those documents, we wanna make sure that we can do that in a way that uh, minimally affects the student's ability to complete a test. <coughs> All right, so now we're going to talk about um, the test environment, um, room setup, desk setup, materials, and accommodations. So what we did this year, a little different than what we did last year, is we um, wanted to put visuals to the explanations that we have. So this is an example of what a classroom could potentially look like um, during like regular school day. There are a number of things that are here that should not be here when testing has, be has begun. As you can see here, um, this is our testing. Um, our students are supposed to be testing, but of course they would be in major violation because there are a number of issues here. Um, in other trainings, we played this as a game, but I'm just gonna point them out in this training. So the first issue here is, um, you see that there's student work here. Um, that's not, that should not be um, visible while students are testing. Um, there's also a math problem here. Um, any assistance here, that, should, oops, that shouldn't be there. Um, life cycle things here. This is all um, testing contents that shouldn't be there. As you see here, these desks are very close together. That's also something that um, probably shouldn't happen. We want to make sure the students are able to see their work. And we will show you what a good classroom will look like in just a second. But let me talk about the content first. So um, wall displays with testing content, test tracking strategies need to be removed or covered. Um, in your testing rooms, hallways, stairwells, et cetera, during testing. Um, they don't have to stay covered when students aren't testing, but while students are testing, so if students are testing from 9 to 11.30, um, these things need to be covered. Um, when we say hallways, stairwells, bathrooms, et cetera, only those hallways, stairways, or bathrooms where students who are testing could potentially um, be moving during testing. So if there's a hallway that um, students who are testing need to um, if they potentially need to use the restroom or whatever, taking breaks or whatever, um, those hallways would need to be covered. If there are hallways or parts of the school where students would not have access to at any point during testing, um, then of course they don't need to be covered. Um, and when we say that displays must be covered prior to the first day of testing, they remain covered for the duration. That just means um, for the entire time that testing is happening, the things should be covered. So if you want to take things down at the end of the day, every day for the entire testing window, you're more than welcome to do that. But as when students are testing, for the entire time students are testing, things should be covered. So this is an example of that same classroom, but with things covered correctly. So as you can see, 
all the tested content is covered, the student work is covered, the desks are spaced um, correctly, there are dividers there, and students here are ready to test. <coughs> We want to call out, um, we don't require um, students to sit in any particular way, but um, we wanted to call out some best practices that we've seen in classrooms that seem to work well um, for maintaining security. If you see students in every other seat, if you have the space for that, or you arrange monitors back to back, you can see students back to back, see students in semicircles, you see students um, in widely spaced rows, as you saw in the uh, previous picture there. Um, we just want to make sure that however students are sitting, they are sitting in a way that other students, of course, cannot see their work. There are, of course, special uh, special considerations. If a student is testing in a one-to-one -one, um, setting for whatever reason, of course, you don't have to change the room as long as, well, you do have to cover up the materials, but you don't have to change the seating in a way that is listed above. So this is a picture of um, a potential desk. There are a few things here that are listed that should never be allowed. Um, I hope as you, as I'm talking, you're thinking about pointing out what those things could potentially be, um, but I will point them out as well. Uh, the first thing is, of course, our cell phone. That should not be there. Um, this list of helpful terms that's not provided by um, the vendor. There's a novel here that shouldn't be here as well. And these are, again, are things that should never be on a desk while students are testing. So before cell phones um, should not be used in the testing environment. Um, for a paper-based test, cell phones shouldn't be in the environment at any point by anyone. Um, for computer-based tests, the school test monitor or the technology coordinator can use a cell phone. If, um, if someone comes into, if someone gets in contact with either of those individuals um, and they need to troubleshoot in any way, those two individuals may have cell phones, but the test administrator, the proctor, or any other adult who is um, assisting in administration should never have a cell phone in the classroom. Um, and this is just a quick call back to the school test plan. So there's a question in the school test plan that asks specifically um, what your school's plan is to ensure that a test coordinator can communicate, a test administrator can communicate with the school test monitor or the technology coordinator. Like how could they get in touch with those individuals during testing? Keeping in mind that a um, test administrator um, cannot use a cell phone during a test. So these are the types of things that are in your school test plan that have real, um, real world implications. So please make sure that as you're filling out your plan, you think about all of these things. Um, in those instances where students um, or the, the testing device, like the computer or the tablet, is experiencing technical difficulties, um, the test administrator should not be looking at the screen to figure out what's going on. They should be contacting the school test monitor or the technology coordinator because those individuals can look to see what the issue is. Um, any technical delays or issues that impact the time. So if a student starts a test but there's some type of issue uh, and the student is not able to finish the test during that session or during that day, um, as I said before, submit an incident report to us so that we can um, discuss the next steps. Uh, another thing that I said was um, in that picture that was never allowed are certain prohibited materials. So there are, for English language arts, there are dictionaries and the sources, those are never allowed. The only instances where they are are a bilingual word-to-word -word dictionary without definitions, but that's just for, uh, an, that's a, an accommodation for English learner students. In any other instance for English language arts, uh, dictionaries or the sources are never allowed. Um, any unauthorized resource or reference material, um, those should never be um, in a student's possession during testing. Similarly, for mathematics, um, formulas, conversion tables that are not vendor um, supplied should never be um, with a student during testing. Any re reference sheets other than the ones that are potentially provided by the vendor should not be there. 
any resources that define or explain um, mathematical terminology or concepts uh, or um, not approved or unauthorized calculators. All right. All right, so um, the next time, now we're gonna look at um, a number of materials that are sometimes allowed. Uh, I'm gonna give you a couple seconds to try to figure out what those are, um, but I'm also going to plug them out. So um, sometimes allowed are dictionaries uh, and calculators. So there are instances where these are allowed, but in most instances, some instances they would not be allowed, and I will talk about that now. So calculators, um, there are a number of requirements and prohibitions around calculators. So when students are allowed to use calculators, there are great level appropriate calculators. They will be available on the platform um, for students to use during um, whatever the appropriate units are for computer-based tests. Um, if stu students are using handheld calculators, that is allowed as well, just making sure that they are grade appropriate and that they're only being used on the calculator sections of each of the assessments. Um, unless a student has uh, an accommodation, students should not be using calculators when um, they are working through non-calculator sections. Um, if a student is using a handheld calculator, um, either because they have an accommodation or because they're testing on a calculator section, it is the test administrator's responsibility to make sure that the memories of those calculators have been cleared out. Um, there are a few calculators that are completely prohibited, so any additional laptop, computer, um, phone-based calculators, those that if they are not on the testing device, so whatever the actual device is that the student is using to take the test, those are prohibited. Um, calculators with the QWERTY, like the full keyboards, unless the student has an accommodation specifically for that, those should not be used. <coughs> and then calculators with CAS features, again, unless there is like an accommodation for that, should not be used at any point during testing. Um, so for accommodations, um, just wanted to put out there that it is a violation um, if a student does not receive the appropriate accommodation or if a student receives an accommodation um, that they're not supposed to receive, both of those would be considered test integrity and security incidents. So those would certainly be um, reported to OSSI so that we can take the appropriate next steps. Um, for students who do have accommodations, it is really important that the students are have the ability to become familiar and comfortable with using those assessments, um, those accommodations before they start taking the test. Um, so we encourage you to work through practice tests and tutorials um, with students because um, once testing begins, the test administrator may not assist the student in using that accommodation unless, of course, they is an accommodation that is a human a human accommodation, but um, for any other accommodations, the students need to know how to use them before testing starts. Um, if you believe that you have a student who needs a unique or a non-standard accommodation that's not included in the manual, um, those need to be reviewed um, and approved to OSSI. There is, um, so you need to reach out to us so that we can talk about what that would look like, um, and they have to be approved before you can use them. In instances where there are emergency accommodations, so something that is temporary, it could result as a um, as an uh, as a result of a student injury or something has happened, and a student needs to use something that they that you at the school did not originally plan for. Um, we do have a form for that, um, and you can access it in the same place that all of our other test security documents are. You would submit that back to us, and we could get back to you with an approval. Um, the last thing to talk about here are support materials. So um, there are instances where um, the test administration manual um, will allow students to bring in um, additional support materials. Um, we just have a few requirements around that. Um, if they are permitted, we ask that the support materials are located in a predetermined location um, before testing begins. 
Um, the test administrator is responsible for making sure that um, any guidance or instructions around those materials are followed um, and that the students are not, um, th that those materials don't have like preloaded information and that they are in a location that is easily accessible during testing. What we don't want is for students to be um, left to go through their things to find these support materials. So it's really important that they are in a centralized location and they are disseminated in a way that is secure once testing has begun. Um, this is uh, just a picture of a potential desk um, with all the right things on it. Everything here is allowed at any time. And then this is another example of a desk just without um, the divider. So this last desk um, is what a desk could look like once close down has happened. Um, students are able to access things after all of their materials have been passed back out. Um, or have been turned back into the test administrator. And there are a few directives that we have specifically around closeout procedures after the test has begun, or after the test has ended. Um, so test administrators are required to follow the closeout protocols as they're detailed in each test administration manual for each student. Um, test administrators need to read the script um, and provide students with the closeout instructions. Um, they are required to follow that word for word. Um, one important note is TAs, test administrators, are not permitted to ask students to check their work um, at any point after testing has begun. That is considered educator coaching. It's something that we see a lot in schools. And so um, as you are teach, as you are training your test administrators, just make sure that you hammer in the point that um, telling students to check their work is not something that they are permitted to do. Um, we have a sample approved statement, something that test administrators can say instead of that, um, which is, are you finished and ready to close out your test? Um, in the instances, if it works for your non-public school um, and the way that it's structured or however the day is scheduled, test administrators can dismiss students um, to go on with their other tasks. If that's not something that you want to do or it's not in your plan, um, students can quietly sit <coughs> and read books or complete other activities after the test, after they've turned in their test. So long as those activities are not directly related with whatever the assessed subject is. So if the students are taking a math assessment, um, they should not be doing math work after that test. Um, and similarly for um, English language arts. If they're finishing an English language arts test, they should not be doing anything that's related to English language arts after they've completed. So we have an example here where after the math test, students can do crossword puzzles, they can read, they can color, they can draw, they can sit with their head down, whatever works for your um, school, but we have examples there. Just making sure that whatever the students are doing um, after they've completed closeout, that the materials, including the testing ticket, the scratch paper, and whatever the testing devices um, are collected before students can move on to whatever it is that they're doing after testing. All right, so now we're going to talk about exceptional circumstances. Um, this is just a list of things that could happen or types of students that you may have at your non-public and what the steps are for um, remedying those issues, remedying those issues. Um, so for absences and makeups, so in your test plan, we have a sample testing schedule that all non-publics must complete and attach back into their plan. Um, we ask for your testing schedule, like your normal testing schedule, and also your school's plan for makeup testing. Um, that should be included in your plan. If you submit a schedule to us that doesn't have any makeup testing dates listed, we will send it back because we want to make sure that um, if a student is absent or unable to test for whatever reason during the day, that there is an opportunity for them to take a makeup test and that you plan for that. Um, you can schedule your makeup tests across grades and subjects, so they don't have to be at separate times. Just making sure that the timing, whatever the timing is for those tests, are the same. So if it's a third grade English test and it's the same time of a fourth grade math test, that's fine. So long as both tests are 45 minutes, they can be tested at the same time. Um, if a student is 
if a student leaves a testing session um, without approval, so not if they have to use the restroom and take a break, but they're not allowed to return into the testing session if they left already. Um, in those instances, like if a student has been kicked out of a test and they're not able to finish it that day, or um, if they're sick and they have to leave early, those types of things should be reported to us so that we can approve a student going back and testing at a different time um, or closing out a test if that is what we determined needs to happen based on the facts of the case. Um, so another exceptional circumstance would be homebound students. So any students who are homebound, they are still required to participate in testing. Um, that may look like a different thing at your non-public or school. So um, what we generally ask in those instances is for you as the school coordinator to work with the LEA and OSSI, um, and we'll figure out what needs to happen for those students. If you have students in any of the cases um, that I'm going to talk about here in a second, um, you need to put that in your school test plan and talk to us so that we can um, know what's happening at your school. So if you have students who um, are testing, need to test in their alternate site, um, that's something that you need to tell us. At Aussie, you will put that in your test plan so that just so that we are aware of any changes that would need to happen. Same thing for homeschool students. If you have students um, that are homeschool at your school, we just need to know who those students are and you need to notify us of that plan. Um, the last would be for students who have significant medical emergencies and so they're not allowed to test for whatever issue, whatever reason. Um, in those instances, um, you can apply for a medical exemption. Um, we ask for that document, which is housed where all of our other test security documents are housed. Um, it's a form. It asks for uh, a signature from a physician. So um, if you are going to apply for a medical exemption, just make sure that you have um, a doctor's note to go along with that. What you would do is you would fill it out, give us a copy of the medical exemption of, um, form signed by the physician, and then we can um, approve that <coughs> here at Austin. If um, it doesn't have to happen necessarily before testing has started, but within um, 10 days after the end of your testing window, you need to have um, apply for all medical exemptions at your school if you need to. Uh, the last exceptional circumstance um, that we speak to in our guidelines are around um, national disasters or school emergencies. In those instances, um, if students need to evacuate in the middle of testing, we ask that you, of course, um, do whatever you need to do to keep your students and your staff safe, um, and then that you submit an incident report to us so that we know what's happening um, and take any next steps if we need to take them. Um, this last note here is just a reminder that <coughs> um, all students, even students who are placed in our publics, of course, are required to um, be tested and all of the requirements that I'm going through in this training also apply as well. All right, so the last thing that we'll talk about um, that happens during testing is ensuring that um, all staff um, do not engage in prohibitive actions. Um, as I said before, all the prohibitive actions are listed twice. They're, the first time they're listed in the um, test integrity notification statement. They're also listed on your school test plan. There's a prohibitive action section that lists out all the same actions that I'm going to talk about now. Um, in the act, um, there's an exhaustive list of uh, prohibitive actions. All authorized personnel, meaning anyone who um, will be interacting with a test or um, testing content at any time, are prohibited from engaging in any of these activities. Um, any engagement of these things would be considered a violation of test security and would need to be reported to OSSI via an incident report during the test administration. Uh, so the first little bucket of violations are around test fraud and coaching. Um, we see this first one a lot. So reviewing, reading, looking at test items, um, responses before, during, or after the administration. Um, the TA should not have any interaction with testing content during um, active testing. If a student is saying that they have a technology issue and they need 
someone to come look at their computer. The test administrator should not be interacting with that. At that point, the test administrator should contact the school test monitor or the technology coordinator who can come into the classroom and look at the computer. Um, as speaking specifically to PARC, if the test administrator wants to see kind of what's going on with the student, there is a um, test administrator dashboard for um, the Pearson Access Next sex section that they should be reviewing, but they should never be reviewing what's on a student's test. Uh, another form of fraud coaching would be assisting students in any way to answer any questions. Um, we've seen this um, sometimes. Um, this could look like actually handing students like pieces of paper with information or answers, um, going back and telling students to check their work, or giving students um, some type of verbal or nonverbal cues to let them know that they have a right or wrong answer. So going by a student looking at their scratch paper and saying, oh, good job, or oh, try again. Those things are considered um, educator coaching and should no one should be doing that during testing. Uh, the second bucket, <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. The second bucket um, around violations are um, Cheating. So cheating is probably the most um, straightforward of the violation bucket. So no one should be um, engaging in cheating. Uh, the test administrator or the proctor or the test monitor, technology coordinator, all of those individuals should be refraining from cheating. Um, cheating is also considered um, not actively supervising students. So if a test coordinator and the proctor leave the classroom, leave the students unattended um, or an extended amount of time or any amount of time that is considered cheating, um, allowing students to use unauthorized um, support materials is also considered cheating, allowing students to use like a calculator and non-calculator section when they don't have an accommodation or allowing students to use a cell phone would also be considered cheating. Um, and of course, using allowing students to use references, books, um, whatever other aids, unless it's been pre-approved by Aussie or is provided by the vendor is also considered cheating. So the last bucket um, is a little more involved. It's a test tampering. So there's lots of ways that um, test tampering um, can show up during test administrator, uh, test administration. Um, we've seen um, test administrators photocopying student work of course, that's tampering, um, any alterations to the test procedures. So if a test administrator is not following the script directly, that's considered test tampering. Um, if the test administrator or any other authorized personnel um, has secure materials, so the testing tickets, scratch paper that's been used, um, guides, um, materials that are provided by the vendor um, during times that they shouldn't have them. So when they should be locked up, but someone has access to them, that is considered uh, tampering, altering student responses, so going back and changing students' work is cheating and tampering. Um, having an answer key when you're not supposed to have an answer key is also considered tampering. Um, more ways that tampering can show up at a school. So if you leave, if the test administrator or the school or you as a non-public coordinator um, leaves the secure materials in a non-secure location, so in the test plan we ask where the test materials will be housed, um, like where would they be locked up at the non-public school. If you leave the test materials out and they're not being um, they're not being watched um, or secured by uh, an individual, that's considered tampering. Um, if a proctor is proctoring their own student's test, um, or if you're a test administrator and you have um, a child, your own child in a classroom, that's considered tampering, not accounting for all of the materials before and after um, testing has begun is tampering as well. And of course, not adhering to the chain of custody during testing is also considered test tampering. Um, <clears throat> the test administrator, uh, there are sections in the test administration manuals where um, test administrators can provide support to students. So 
when students are logging in, if they're having difficulties logging in, a test administrator or a proctor can provide support. But once testing has started, any support that um, happens would need to be completed by the technology coordinator. And just as a reminder, um, students should know how to use accommodations and accessibility features um, that are on the platform before testing begins because um, the test administrator and the proctor cannot assist the student in accessing or using uh, accessibility features or accommodations once testing has begun. Um, there are a few exceptions. So of all the things that we just talked about for preventive actions, some of those things need to happen um, in certain circumstances. So if um, if you need to do one of those actions that I just listed um, in order to support a student um, in completing an accommodation as listed in their IEP, their 504 plan, or their EL plan, that of course would not be considered a violation. Or if you're supporting a student to stay on task, but again, I would err on the side of caution there. Um, when you're having a student to stay on task, we have a few um, instances where it's okay to help a student to stay on task and what that would look like. Um, so if you wanted to announce to the entire um, testing group their remaining time on the test, you can, that's not in the script necessarily, but you can, uh, the test administrator can make an announcement of that. Um, you can announce to the entire group to stay on task. Um, you can remind students to abide by school rules. Um, you can wake up a student who's fallen asleep during the test. Um, for students who are disruptive, you can um, move them to another location or try to diffuse the situation, keeping in mind that you're not distracting other students and their ability to take a test. You can remind individuals to stay on task, um, both verbally and non-verbally. Just making sure that you err on the side of caution there, because if someone is there to monitor your classroom, uh, if someone is there to monitor a TA's classroom, um, the last two um, bullets there could be considered, someone could think that it's something that's not. All right, so um, after testing, there are a few tasks that have to happen. Um, so at OSSI, our level, we collect all affidavits and um, verify data that we receive from LEAs and schools. And at the LEA level, they sign an uh, affidavit they collect the affidavits from the school coordinators um, and then they do a plan of action or whatever other things that we require. At the school level, you're responsible for um, returning and disposing of any secure materials back to the vendors. If you need to send it back, you need to document any missing materials or any remaining incidents that you may have not reported to us at any point. You would sign and submit your affidavits. Um, to the non, <coughs> to the um, LEA coordinators within 10 days, and then both the LEA and you at the non-public could document any remaining incidents, as I said before. So the affidavits, for those who are following along in the packet, um, document number five is a copy of this year's test security affidavit. Um, this is an affidavit that only you as the um, non-public coordinators um, need to fill out. So you would go in and fill out this document. If you are the non-public coordinator for both the MSAA and the park assessment or whatever um, combination of assessments you oversee, you can write each of those um, assessments in the box that asks for the assessment. Um, but just make sure that if you are um, if you did oversee multiple assessments that you provide an affidavit for both of those assessments or you put both of those assessments on your one document. You would fill out the document, certify um, all the information, sign it, and then submit it to your LEA. So if, if you are an individual who has students at multiple LEAs, just make multiple copies and send those to your LEAs. The LEAs will be expecting those documents. They may reach out to you to ask you for those documents. Um, and then once they receive them, they will submit them to us within 15 days. All right, so that is actually the end of this training. Um, I'm going to give you about 30 minutes back. Um, 
If you have any questions, I'm going to take a couple minutes to open up the questions box and see, um, and I'm more than willing to answer some questions. All right, so I'm not seeing any questions. Um, if you have any questions as you're going through this training or if you're, if you're looking at this webinar at a different time and you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me. And I will do a quick announcement about Access for Elves and our alternate assessments. Um, if you have any questions about um, either of those assessments, I ask that you reach out to our lead here at OSSI for both of those. Um, assessment that would be Michael Craig. His email address is listed here. Please reach out to him and he'll be providing you additional information about either of those assessments. Uh, the next thing that I'll call out um, is our training schedule. So we have a number of trainings that we feel are would be useful for certain individuals um, in preparation for testing. Um, we have, if you go, if you follow this link here at the bottom, it'll take you to this um, document here it'll allow you to register for any upcoming trainings that we may have <clears throat> and then this is our contact information for the team so um, i'll leave this up as i say farewell if you have any questions um, and you don't know who to contact this is the slide that you will have all of that information if you click on the links it'll take you to our email addresses so um, again i want to thank you for participating in this training um, for those who are going to participate in the um, DC Science and Park non-public training, it will start at 3.30 um, and the link will be in the chat box, but also you can access it on the um, training site, that the training page that I just showed. So thank you again and please look out for um, the recording of this webinar on the School Test Plan website. Thank you.